Put your hands together for Mike Newswanger. All right. So first off, Elastic Booth, we got lots of giveaways, and you got a pretty high chance of winning right now because we don't have a whole lot of entries. So check it out. But my talk, what containers don't solve? Uh, didn't get to do a time run through, so it'll probably be a little short. But early lunch, right? So containers solve everything. Oh. Great. So that's it. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> all right, all right. I kid, I kid, I kid. But if you go to uh, any, any talks technically lately, it's containers solve all your problems, right? Containers, I mean, anything that you can possibly think of technical problem-wise, a container will come out and it'll fix the problem. Eh, maybe, maybe not. But first off, let's talk a little bit about Oh, never mind. We'll, we'll go into what's the container next. Uh, I'm Mike Nieswanger, um, currently a senior software engineer at Elastic. So I work on our past platform, a lot of behind the scenes orchestration type work. So making the containers come up to run your services. And previously, SRE at Stack Overflow. So did a lot around infrastructure and development. Um, Twitter, and I'm Nieswanger. If you got feedback, questions, comments, whatever, uh, feel free to hit me up there or come see me at the Elastic booth. I'll be there this afternoon. So containers are a lie. First and foremost, everybody's all like, oh, a container's not a real thing. Which, OK, yeah, technically, if you break it down, a container isn't actually a concept that a kernel understands. It's all namespaces, C groups, yada, yada, yada. You've got abstraction layers, right? But if you break it down to anything like that, everything is. So it's all about focus, right? Because if you take a high-level application, you don't care about the malloc calls necessarily underneath. You just know when I request memory, I'm going to get memory, and it abstracts to that. The kernel doesn't need to know exactly what a container is. The container is an abstraction to let you separate that out. And so it gives you a nice set of benefits, and it gives us a common verbiage to talk about things, which that, in my opinion, is what a container is. And it doesn't matter, like, Technically, OK, yeah, this thing might not know exactly what a container is. A process doesn't know if it's running in a container. But like I said, that's all abstraction details that really are irrelevant. But containers add complexity. So raise your hands if you're an ops. Now raise your hands and keep your hands up if you're still uh, ops people. Keep them up. How many of you are developers? Network admins? Proficient with Linux kernels? OK, so that's a good start, right? So all of those pieces become slightly more intertwined when you deal with containers. So traditional infrastructure adds a little bit more flexibility between separation of roles. So you don't need to have necessarily all of those pieces, but you do need to have those on your team. So it does add a little bit more complexity into the initial, here's what we need to get containers running and to be able to maintain. Because, OK, you watch a demo, Docker run, boom, done, right? And you've got your container running, your process is running in a container, and all's well with the world. Well, the problem is, once you hit production, stuff comes up. Things come up unexpectedly. You never really know what your production workload's going to be 100% until you're in production. So you need to be able to support it. So you can think of it like a, a, uh, an orchestra. So you can have people that have different strengths. Oftentimes, you'll find people in the orchestra that they play multiple instruments, but they're going to be really good at one. And so having that with a variety of skills, multiple strong points, and the ability to rely on others, because an orchestra is going to sound pretty terrible if there's just one instrument playing all the time and nobody else can coordinate, right? So we, we need skills. So it, it takes a lot of skills, takes a little bit different skill set. But overall, a lot of the skills are portable into containers from where you're at. But it's never just containers, right? Because all right, it's great. You go onto your system, you type in on your terminal, you do Docker run, and then you move on to your next system and you do the same thing. And you go to the next system and you do the same thing. And it's feeling a little te tedious and repetitive, right? That's not good. You want to be able to say at a higher level, let's bring up containers. Let's make sure that the state maintains across multiple nodes to where we need it. So enter the orchestration platform. Now, most of you have heard Kubernetes at this point. So there's Kubernetes. That adds even more complexity to the problem. 
Because how many of you have used Kubernetes extensively? How many of you have rolled Kubernetes in a production environment? Gets pretty complex, doesn't it? So you don't just have containers. You also have a host of other problems that come along for the ride with containers. Debugging processes change, particularly if you go the microservices route, which often goes hand in hand with containers. So you go in, you have your giant monolith, and everybody dreams of the day where you can split the monolith up and you've got reasonable breakpoints between components and yada, yada, yada. Well, what happens when your RPC calls fail between components? How do you track that down? It requires a different set of debugging skills. It's going to be, once again, something that's similar between what you've done historically and what you can do in the future, but you do need different tooling. Distributed chasing becomes a thing. Service discovery becomes important, things like that where it's no longer as straightforward as just watching one process in one system follow its way through from start to completion. So you add a lot of complexity going here. Now, everybody loves to say, oh, Docker, it works the same in dev as it does prod, right? Well, here's dev, here's prod. You got your cute little puppy, and you got the big old German shepherd. And that's kind of like what it is running dev versus prod, because how many of you have dev environments that are as big as your production environments? And of those with your hands up, which is nobody, how many of you have a workload that simulates your production one-to-one? -one? Right. You're going to run into stuff in prod that you haven't hit in dev. You push loads past where they're capable of running on systems, and stuff breaks. So as much as you'd love to say, yeah, it's going to run in prod the same way, you don't really know that for sure, and you have to be able to go back and figure out why it didn't run the way you expected it to and fix it. All the while, support lines are blowing up, everybody's losing their minds because you're about to violate SLA, and yeah, fired, right? The next problem is security. Now, take a look at this image for a bit. How many of you would feel safe with your phone locked up like that? Once again, no hands. Good. You guys are a smart crowd. So <laughs> if you think about it in terms of, of technical security, it's kind of the same way. Your traditional security practices and platforms have worked well in the past. They solve for problems that existed, but the security problems shift a little bit. So let's take a case study. How effective is this from a defensive standpoint? You got yourself a big old castle, probably some moats around, Really strategic position. I mean, all right, so let's get back a couple hundred years. You're chilling in there. You're like, hey, you're just drinking whatever, whatever mead you've got and, I don't know, maybe some whiskey, whatever you have at the time, eating your game that you just hunted. And you're all feeling safe because it's a castle. Who wouldn't want a freaking castle? But at the time, we've got the knight in shining armor the dudes that go out and joust for fun, archers, which the most effective longbows would be good for about 400 yards. So I mean, that's decent range. Not bad, right? A little over a quarter mile. And your transport's by ship, or by horse, or by walking. So having a strategically placed castle can really give you a good stronghold. Now, trebuchets, how many of you have played Age of Empires as a kid? or as an adult, because it's still fun, right? So the trebuchets are what you use to bring down a castle. You roll them in, you set them up, but it takes a while to bring a trebuchet in, it takes a while to set it up. And even still, it takes a while to bring a castle down, because you need things to throw at it. And overall, you're pretty safe in a castle. But two inventions come along. We've got the modern rifle and the airplane. The modern rifle takes your range of effectively 400 if you're a really good archer to if you're a really good sniper over a mile and a half. So having that foothold with that defensive, you're no longer battling from an uphill position with a sword. You've now got to defend against something completely different that's much, much, much more precise and much more effective at longer ranges. Airplanes take away the, uh, the ground control, right? So rather than having to dock and walk in to a mainland, you can just take the airplane right across the castle. Your castle becomes irrelevant, right? So how secure is it? Not very. 
And that's kind of how containers are. Containers themselves are not insecure. There's a lot of, oh, but what if somebody pops a box and gets root from a container? OK, yeah, it's possible. Hasn't happened in a couple years. So fairly unlikely. But let's take a look at something that has happened recently, Tesla. So anybody not familiar with Tesla? OK, they make electric cars, right? They also run Kubernetes. And through a series of unfortunate events, they effectively gave too much power to a service account that was running their Kubernetes dashboard that was exposed to the internet and let people run whatever, and in this case, uh, cryptocurrency miners, on their Kubernetes cluster. So effectively, you can have the most secure setup in the world and you screw up on one security token, give it too much permission, somebody pops that, which, okay, there's no security to even pop, great, easy win. And now they can do whatever they want to your cluster. So it kind of highlights two things. One, your traditional uh, security attacks are kind of shifting, where people are trying to monetize on being able to run something like a crypto miner on your hardware. Uh, so the attacks aren't as directed trying to mine specific data as much as they are trying to take advantage of your resources. And so that kind of shifts a little bit of the mindset, right? And two, it shows that no matter how strong you set everything up, all it takes is one weak piece to the puzzle, and that's where your security breaks down. How many of you know exactly what's in every single one of the containers that you run? So when you build a container, oftentimes the process is go to Google, you download a container. Oh, I am pulling down Joe Schmo's PHP 5.5 container. This is great. I can just get set up, I can drop my application in, and it runs, and everything is perfect with the world, right? What is Joe Schmo's PHP 5.5 container actually doing? What's it built on? If you don't go back, evaluate the build process, evaluate what's actually going on in there, or better yet, build it yourself, you really don't know because Joe Schmo could be installing PHP 5.5, he could also be installing mybackdoor.snail, and that exposes via PHP 5.5 so that Joe Schmo can get into all your servers that way. And once again, you can expose an island hop, he gets in there, does whatever he wants, and then moves on, and you once again aren't very secure. So it's just a little bit of a shift of how much do you control in your pipeline and what are you watching out for? State. So how many of you remember watching The Matrix? Oh, more hands than that. Come on, second floor. Pay attention. I want to see all the hands. <laughs> so in The Matrix, one of the early scenes when Neo first goes into the, uh, into the Matrix, he sees a black cat walk by, right? And what happens right after that? He sees it again. And that is exactly what happens when your state gets out of sync, right? You see two events that should be just one event. And that's just one way a state can get out of sync. But things like that get a little bit trickier once you get fully distributed through containers. So containers make the promise, oh, if you don't like what you see, you just rerun the old version of the container. Everything is back to exactly how it was. Yeah, maybe not. So instant rollback, the promise. We've got little rubber ducky. Every single little rubber ducky is the same. And if we don't like the way rubber ducky is working, we just take it and put old rubber ducky right back. Theoretically, great. I mean, if that's how the real world worked, then a lot of us wouldn't have jobs, right? Because it's that easy. Well, persistent data comes into play. When you're dealing with containers, you're often dealing, like I said, with container orchestrators. You don't know exactly where your container is going to live, right? Because it could spin up on server A, server B, server dog, server cat, server Yoda. Because who knows what you're naming these things anymore, because it really doesn't matter. So your persistent data either has to live locally, which means you lose portability for a container, which means you lose high availability. Or it has to be distributed somewhere, shared in, which means now you're reliant on network connectivity to be able to get to your data. So th there's a lot of trickiness around the persistent data story. It's all solvable. It's just a matter of what trade-offs you want to make. But it's something that needs to be thought about and makes the state a little bit trickier than historically it's been, because 
if you got a VM, your VM's not going to necessarily go down and come back up somewhere else without any data because the data is all attached to the VM. If VMware does a DRM migration for you, you don't even know that it moved, but all the data and state go along with it. You're not going to get that with containers. So that's a problem you got to think about. The other thing is databases. So once again, back to the little rubber ducky. Old rubber ducky runs great. New rubber ducky needs a database migration. Now your database schema doesn't match what it used to match. Uh-oh. Old rubber ducky doesn't run anymore. This is bad news. So there's a bunch of different approaches to doing this and a lot of different uh, techniques that work or don't work, but it's something that you need to address. It's not a problem that's going to just magically go away because you're running in a container instead of on a VM or bare metal anymore. And it's a tricky problem to solve. If there was an easy way, once again, DBAs would all be out of a job, right? Because that's a lot of what DBAs have to deal with. So when you're dealing with databases, uh, one of the common patterns that you could do is make sure that a revision can support three versions back. So when you do a migration, then you make the migration for new version be able to support the old version, and then newer, newer version can once again support two versions back, and then third version you trash the two versions back, or three versions back that no longer needs to be supported, and then you have a roll forward plan. But the problem is, whenever you do ch big changes like that, you still induce risk. So even if you try to make it that you can roll forward and back certain amounts of versions, you still have risks when you make schema changes, when you make data updates, when you make assumptions in your application that your data is going to look a certain way and then not have it match. So databases get real tricky. But nothing to scare you off yet, right? You guys got this. And then the old dream, eventual consistency. How many of you have legacy apps that assume eventual consistency? Huh. Once again, no hands. So legacy apps typically assume synchronous data, right? They assume when something happens, it gets a response back. And when that something happens and the response gets back, that everything is good in terms of state. Well, eventual consistency kind of changes that. It introduces your system distribution well. And it's a very good pattern. It's not that eventual consistency is in and of itself bad. But your application needs to know that eventual consistency is a thing. It needs to know that it could take a little bit of time for your change to appear in the actual application. Because if you assume that it's going to take place right away, even a couple milliseconds of latency can be too much to trip up your application if it's doing an operation, assuming that operation went through, and then rely on that moving forward. So eventual consistency is one of those things that, yeah, it's great, but it does need to be designed for. So it's not as easy to do a lift and shift as some people make it seem out to be. And problem number four, and this one's huge, culture. Containers are not going to magically come in and fix a broken culture problem, right? So containers, the big promise is go fast. Containers can spin up in sub-second. VMs, eh, best case you're probably looking a couple seconds, most likely a couple minutes to a couple hours. So containers come in and, whoa, if we can deploy this fast, then we can really move. So containers give you that, and it's great. You can fly along. But show of hands, how many of you would say your biggest problem is you can't bring up VMs fast enough in terms of boot time? None. So you got this problem right here, right? It's great that your containers can go to super fast, but if you're not blocked by the startup speed, then is that really getting you anything? Because I mean, if, if you drive that GTR that we saw on the first slide there, right here, where are you going to go? You're going to go right into the bumper of the car in front of you. It's not going to get you anywhere. So speed has constraints. And spoiler alert, people cause technical problems. How have you worked with a PM that's changed scope on you near completion of a project? How many of you deal with users that put data that you don't expect into random fields on your website? I mean, stuff like that. No matter what happens, you've got people causing your technical problems. <clears throat> so story time. So I worked at a, a company a couple years back. And we were growing e-commerce site. And we needed a security team. So we start hiring for security people. 
And the security team came in. We got a manager. We started adding security people to the team. And now we need to be more secure with the way we deploy things. So rather than just being able to implement firewall rules whenever we need to, we now have to go through security. So the, the focus shifts from the ops and SRE teams to the security team for firewall rule implementation. Which, OK, seems reasonable. They can do that. But then the other problem came in with security rules would only get deployed two days a week. So developers wouldn't necessarily know ahead of time that they need export opened up between two services. And we get to the point where we'd be choked back. So when we're dealing with the problem, it's not really a technical problem. It's processes to get our speed. So what happens then? Well, obviously, we need a way that as we go on, we can push through emergency fixes. Because if something's breaking in production or something that's a hugely important feature can't go out because security hasn't improved it, well, now, well, OK, we can put in a process that when, hmm, well, why don't we say when somebody pushes something that's really important, we can just do it at any point in time. So, so long as security says there's nothing really red flaggy about it, we can just implement that whenever. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, so now we've got a process. We've got a, a workaround in case we run into something that's super important. Well, guess what happens when you do something like that? How many non-urgent problems do you think came through after that one? Hey, we got a winner. So basically, what happens is people put the processes in place, and that kind of thing isn't going to be fixed by a container. That's going to be fixed by working together with another team, figure out what the actual pain point and problems are, and then fix the actual problems. So let's recap here. Containers add a lot of complexity. There's a lot more moving pieces, a lot more tight coupling between components, and overall, a lot of added complexity. They change the security paradigm. It's not to say containers are less secure, but it's just different problems you've got to focus on. So you need to make sure that your mindset is where you need to be and not based on history. State becomes very painful. I mean, not necessarily any more so than before, but it's still a pain point. And culture can be a really big issue. So my key takeaway from all of this is solve for the problems you have, not the problems you want to have. Found that on Programmer, Programmer Wisdom's Twitter the other day, which was great, because it's perfect. Because if you have a container problem that, OK, we do need to spin up thousands of these things an hour and tear them back down and keep going, great, solve it with a container. If you don't need to solve it with a container, focus on your actual problem and spend the effort there rather than trying to get to the latest hotness and go from there. Which leaves us with our actual end, which is a barren wasteland. <laughs> and that's technology for you. <laughs>